Right before we jump into this video, if you haven't signed up for the Fronos Photo email list, just look for this orange box over on the website. Put your name, email address in it, hit send it, and I will send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations. Jared Poland, Fronos Photo. Dot com, and this is a major comparison video between the Nikon Z6, Sony a7 III, EOS R, and the Panasonic S1. Now, before I go too far, I do want to let you know that this is all based off of my real world experience using each and every one of these cameras. And there are links down below that will take you to the real world reviews of these cameras and where you can download sample RAW files to determine whether you like those files or not, or to help you decide which camera is right for you. Because that is what this video is all about. Running through the top level specs and based on my real world experience, helping you decide which one of these might be the one that you end up taking home. Now, each one of these manufacturers, except for maybe Canon, considers these to be their hybrid cameras, you know, ones that are great for stills as well as great for video. And in all honesty, the EOS R is going to do both. We know that, and we'll get to the specs as we move forward, but we actually thought long and hard on whether or not to include the EOS R here because of the specs that it has, but based on the price nowadays, it's worthy of being put in this lineup. Moving on to the specs, let's start with the sensors that you find in each one of these cameras with the Z6 giving you a 24.5 megapixel full frame BSI CMOS sensor. The Sony a7 III gives you a 24.2 megapixel full frame BSI CMOS sensor. The EOS R has a 30.3 megapixel full frame CMOS sensor, which is the same as the 5D Mark IV, but optimized with a Digic 8 processor. And the Panasonic S1 has a 24.2 megapixel full frame MOS sensor. So as you can see, most of these are 24 megapixels. And honestly, I would think that Sony is making the sensors or doing some kind of development with the companies to tweak it to their specifications for the Nikon as well as the Panasonic. And Canon, on the other hand, makes their own sensors. So which one gets the check mark up here for the, the best when it comes to quality? Uh, I'm gonna, you know what? I'm gonna give a check mark upside down to none of them because in this day and age, they are so close in quality that you won't be able to tell the difference. Just more go out and shoot and know what you're doing and you're gonna get good results with each one of these if you had to go out and shoot with them. Moving on to ISO. The Z6 goes from 100 to 51,200, expandable all the way up to 204,800. It's exactly the same for the Sony as well as the Panasonic with the Canon coming in at 100 to 40,000 native ISO, expandable up to 102,400. Yeah, very similar sensors as you can see. Canon not getting the check mark in this case because the other ones do a better job natively. I've pushed the Z6 fairly far. I've pushed the A7 III far. I didn't really push the S1 too far, but I think that these are going to be on par with each other. It's very hard to give a check mark on which ones would have the best ISO. I know I'm supposed to give check marks to cameras, but it is difficult when they have very similar sensors that are gonna get fairly similar results. With that all being said, and knowing that the Canon's native ISO isn't as good as these other three, we're just gonna give a negative check mark to the EOS R. Moving on to frames per second. How many frames a second can we get out of the Z6? We've got 12 frames a second in 12-bit RAW, nine frames a second in 14-bit RAW in high extended mode, and 5.5 frames a second in normal high mode. The Sony, on the other hand, does 10 frames a second with both the electronic and the mechanical shutter. The Canon does eight frames a second in one shot, five frames a second in speed priority, and three frames a second in tracking priority. That's pretty bad. That's terrible, Canon, really. Thank you for not doing something good. The Panasonic S1 shoots at six frames a second in continuous, nine frames a second in single, and it drops down to five frames a second when you are shooting in continuous silent. On top of that, the Panasonic will give you a 6K photo mode that can do 30 frames a second, or if you dumb it down to 4K, you can get 60 frames a second, except all of that is only in JPEG. The winner here, 
hands down getting the biggest check mark that's covering the entire screen is the Sony a7 III. 10 frames a second mechanical, 10 frames a second silent. This was the first camera out before these other three and it still did a better job with mechanical and silent shooting. Why did the other guys get it so wrong? I don't know. Which one gets it the most wrong? Canon. Canon gets it the most wrong in this case. I still like the camera, but it gets it wrong. Three frames a second for a priority focus? I shot it in the five frames, it did a good job, except for every time you shoot a picture, it kind of shows you a preview of the last one for a split second, so you don't exactly have this live preview the entire time. Whereas with the, the, the Sony, the Sony just kicks ass, thus why it got that massive check mark across the screen. Let me jump in here real quick and say if you're looking to speed up your workflow or add some creative edits to your RAW files, we created 14 custom Lightroom presets that you can check out at fronosphoto.com presets. While you're there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and afters and see how the images look. And if you decide to pick them up, they are on sale for 40% off right now. For example, these images were edited using FroPack 1. Now let's move on to the lens mounts because there are different mounts for each one of these cameras. Starting with the Nikon Z6, it has a Z mount as well as you can get an F to Z adapter so you can mount your F mount lenses, which is what we do here at the factory. Actually, this camera that's shooting down here has a 70 to 200 2.8 mounted with the F to Z adapter with the Nikon Z6 and it works fantastically well. So if you already have a lot of F mount glass, and you get a Z6, you can certainly put your lenses on it. Now, one of the downsides is that there's not a lot of native Z mount glass yet for the Z6. Sony, on the other hand, is using an E mount. Now, there is a decent selection of lenses that you can get for the E mount. Now, unlike Nikon, which has a larger mount, and uh, Canon, which also has a larger mount, there's been a lot of talk about why did Sony stick with a smaller mount and will that hurt them in the future? but there is a large selection of E-mount glass that you can pick up for this system, much more so than going back two, three, four years. And also, Sigma is starting to make E-mount lenses natively for the Sony system. Continuing down the line, we've got the Canon EOS R, which is now using an RF mount. That RF mount is fantastic, and the lenses that they're coming out with for the RF line are unbelievable. They're expensive, but they are fantastic and I cannot wait for them to upgrade the system uh, to go with a more higher end body. But with that being said, I've gotten fantastic results with the EOS R. I may shit all over it and a lot of people may be taking a dump on it, but if you had this camera and you had any of your lenses, you can get fantastic results with it because it still comes down to you. But also, you can adapt your EF lenses to this camera. There's three different mounts that you can get, and it works unbelievably well. Mounting the 70 to 200 2.8 version 3 onto this camera, it is blazing fast when it comes to the autofocus, and I am really happy with the adapted lenses as well as the new RF lenses. And finally, the Panasonic S1 is a part of the... L Mount Alliance. For whatever that means. Well, it's part of the L Mount Alliance, which is an alliance between three different companies. You've got Leica, you've got Panasonic, and you've got Sigma. All manufacturing lenses using an L Mount. Now, Panasonic only has three native lenses for this camera currently. So there's not a lot of choices when it comes to getting L mount glass natively. Sigma has a roadmap by 2020, should have 40 different L mount lenses. Jared, don't half ass it. It has 40 L mount lenses. That's right, coming in the next couple of years. So I think the Panasonic S1 will have enough lenses in the future. I'm Oh, good boy, oh boy, what, what, which one is gonna get the, you know what? I'm giving the Canon the check mark in this system. Even though Sony should probably get the check mark because they've been around longer and they have a larger selection of glass. I like the RF glass a lot. I love that you can adapt. You know what? No, Sony shouldn't get a check mark. Why? 
because of all of the other EF glass that you can mount onto this system, the RF system is one of my favorites. So, so Canon's gonna get a, a teeny tiny check mark. What good is a camera if it doesn't autofocus very well? Yeah, not much unless you're old school and say that everything should be shot manually, which I disagree with. It should not be shot manual. One, my eyes blurry, so I can't normally see manual focus anyway, but this isn't about me. This is helping you decide which camera is right for you. The Z6 has 273 focus points with their phase detect AF system, as well as IAF was included in the last firmware update. The Sony has 693 focus points that are phase detect AF systems that go edge to edge covering 93% of the viewfinder. You also have IAF as well as touch focusing. As I've said before, one of the greatest things about mirrorless cameras is the fact that you can move your focusing points all the way to the edges for all intents and purposes. Moving on to the Canon, they give you 5,655 phase detect auto focusing points. Now it's not like you look through the camera and you're like, hey look, there's 5,500 red boxes. There's not. They must have that many points available, but you can't really select individually between them. Now you do have IAF with the Canon. It's not nearly as good as the Sony in my opinion, and it's probably not as good as the one in the Nikon. But with that being said, with the IAF and the Canon, with our tests with the latest firmware, uh, you kind of have to get much closer to acquire the eye than you do with something like the Sony. So you have to fill the frame more or get much closer, which kind of defeats the purpose if you're further back and you want to focus in on the eye and it's kind of only hitting this area. So that's one thing there. The Panasonic S1 has 225 point contrast detect AF point system. Now it uses depth from defocus AF, which is kind of weird. It offers you IAF, animal AF for birds, dogs, and cats. And it's kind of awkward to work with at times. You get some of this focusing on the back, focusing on the foreground, it jumps around. And when you're trying to shoot your photos, it looks different when you press the shutter halfway down and take your finger off. The exposure kind of changes in your viewfinder. But which one of these offers you the best autofocus? If I had to give a check mark, and I, I do have to give a check mark because that's why we're making this video, it is the Sony. 693 autofocusing points with IAF and the tracking that this camera gives you. This is the oldest camera, but with the firmware updates that they've done, this has the best autofocus. It has the best IAF. It is fantastic. Not far behind that, or, you know, kind of like behind it, like, hey, I'm still here. The Canon does a great job focusing. It is fast focusing. The Nikon is not as fast as these two, but it still does a very nice job with autofocus, and the IAF is pretty okay. And the Panasonic isn't that bad. It's not that bad, but one of the downsides to the Panasonic S1 is its autofocusing capability. That's one of the things I don't like about the camera that I hope they do change. Moving on to burst rate and how many RAW files you can get in a row because I shoot RAW, I don't shoot JPEG. The Nikon Z6 will give you 43 RAW files in a row in high extended. In normal high mode, the buffer doesn't fill. So you're pretty much not gonna outrun this camera. Now part of the reason for that we're gonna to get to in a minute when we talk about the memory cards. The Sony a7 III does 40 RAW files in a row, the EOS R does 47 RAW files in a row, and the Panasonic S1 is doing 90 RAW files in a row. Check mark, Panasonic, congratulations on your first check mark that's lonely all by yourself. Congratulations, everybody. Hey, hey guys, congratulate Panasonic for a check mark. Let me jump in here and say, are you looking to build your own online website? Well, I personally use Squarespace to build jaredpoland.com and I wouldn't use anything else. To get a 14 day free trial, head on over to squarespace.com slash photo. And if you decide that it's for you, use the code photo at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Since we just talked about how many raw shots you can get in a row, let's look at the memory cards that these cameras offer you. The Nikon Z6 offers you one one XQD card. I love XQD cards, which is reverse compatible with the future of CF Express, which is a super fast, amazing card that I cannot wait for it to come out with. But one card is still not my favorite. Now the Sony offers you two SD card slots. That's nice of you, Sony. 
but you invented the XQD card and you didn't support it at all in any of your cameras. The USR uses one SD card. That's kind of stupid. If I had to pick to throw one of these out because of just one, like an SD card is more likely to break than a XQD card. I just love the XQD cards, SD cards, stupid. Anyway, the Panasonic S1 decided to do something super smart. They put in an XQD card and an SD card. I would have preferred because it does have room for two XQD cards, but for whatever reason, they decided to do an XQD, which is reverse compatible with CF Express and one UHS-2 SD card slot. Hey, let's congratulate Panasonic on another victory. Check mark Panasonic, good job. Nice job, Panasonic, why? Because it has two cards and it includes one XQD. Moving on to the electronic viewfinder, which is extremely important when you are shooting with a mirrorless camera, because if you didn't have an EVF, you would just be using the screen on the back, which would kind of make you look like an amateur out there using your camera like this, but that's beside the point. Some of you guys probably do do that, which I don't exactly recommend. The EVF on the Z6 is a 3.69 million dot one. The one on the Sony is a 2.4 million dot EVF. 3.69 dot on the Canon, and following up at the rear, and by rear, I mean they're actually gonna win the check mark again, is the Panasonic with a 5.7 million dot live view EVF is what they call it. Now, before I congratulate them again for that very subtle check mark that I just gave them, it's interesting because Sony most likely makes the EVF for the Z6. The oldest camera up here does have the worst EVF of them all. I am not a fan of the EVF in this Sony at this time. Back in the day when it was all that was around, it was okay. But since Sony makes EVFs, their next one is going to be fantastic. I really like the EVF in the EOS R. That's something they got right. I really like what they did with it. And the Z6, the EVF is fine as well. But the Panasonic EVF is my favorite out of all of these cameras right here. They did a fantastic job with this one and I absolutely loved shooting with it. It gave me the exact representation of my exposure in front of me, meaning I wasn't off by a half a stop or a full stop or a little less. I was pretty much within a quarter of a stop each raw file that I took. And that's why we get a Checky McCheckerson mark for the Panasonic. That's like three in a row for Panasonic. Holy hat trick, Panasonic, throw the hats on the screen. Now that we've talked about electronic viewfinders, let's talk about the screens on the back of the camera with the Z6 having a 3.2 inch, 2.1 million dot tilting touchscreen. The Sony has a, oh boy, this is, this isn't very good. A three inch, 922,000 dot tilting touchscreen with a limited amount of touch options for actually touching the screen to do things, to do functions. Whereas most of the other cameras let you do everything in the menu by touching them. This one doesn't like to be touched. It's like no touch, bad touch. Reminds me of a song. So let's do it like they do on the Discovery Channel. I don't know, get horny now. That was a very good song in 1999. Moving on to the EOS R, you have a 3.15 inch, 2.1 million dot, very angle touch screen LCD, which is fantastic because you can flip it out, rotate it, and reverse it. Mish, 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 mish. The Panasonic S1 offers you a 3.2 inch, 2.1 million dot tri-axle, that's right, Axel Rose touchscreen. It's like, it plays November Rain every time you pull it out. It's like, meow. I'm good at air guitar, I just don't know how to play guitar. The winner here, Jared, the people just said shut up and, and they said it in my ear. They're like, shut up and just give it a check mark. Uh, Canon, check mark. Very angle touchscreen, probably the best choice, best option. It gives you the most options for having it in front of you, rotating it, doing vlogging, if that's what you want to do, check mark EOS R. Moving on to built-in stabilization, the Nikon Z6 offers you five axis in-body VR. The Sony offers you five axis steady shot. The Canon EOS R offers you, yeah, they don't offer you anything. I mean, they offer you digital stabilization. In this day and age, that's a fail. Fail, big fail across the screen, like poof. That's right, you failed Canon on that. And the Panasonic has five axis in-body image stabilization, but when it's paired with some of their OIS lenses, you can get up to six and a half stops 
of IBIS. So the winner here, I'm gonna go with Panasonic for their dual IS system of stabilization when it's paired with those lenses, six and a half stops. Canon, Canon, hey you, yeah you. Yeah, you better get that right next time. Now, when I said that these are hybrid cameras, the reason I said that is they do stills and they offer you amazing video quality. So let's go through the specs right now, starting with the Z6. You have full frame 4K at up to 30 frames a second. That's oversampled from 6K with no pixel binning. You can do 10-bit 422-4K to an external recorder with a very slight crop. You can do full frame 120 frames a second at 1080, which is awesome. You can get N-Log and future firmware update will enable raw video recording to external recorders. That's pretty action packed for a company that really wasn't known for shooting video. Nikon did a fantastic job with the video features of the Z6. Moving on to the a7 III, you have full frame 4K at up to 30 frames a second, 4K oversampled from 6K with no pixel binning, full frame 120 frames a second at 1080, and you get S-Log. This is still one of the best cameras on the market for shooting video all around this is a fantastic camera. Sony knocked it out of the park and this is why this thing continues to sell time and time again. Now Canon EOS R gives you, oh boy, a 1.74X crop 4K at up to 30 frames a second, 10-bit 422 4K out with an external recorder. You can get C-Log 720p at 120 frames a second, but it does not offer you continuous autofocus when you do the 720p. This is one of the most crippled bodies you could ever have for shooting video. Why 1.74 X crop factor when everybody else is doing full frame 4K? <sighs> I'm not even gonna go there. Now the S1 is fully loaded. You get full frame 4K at up to 30 frames a second, oversampled from 6K with no pixel binning, 10-bit 420 internal 4K recording with HLG, 4K at up to 60 frames a second with a super 35 crop, Full frame, 150 frames per second at 1080p, which is pretty cool, but there's no AF or manual controls, so it's basically auto exposure. There is a paid firmware update that will enable 10-bit 422-4K internal recording and V-Log and, whoo, unlimited record time, except when you're shooting at 60 frames a second in 4K. Unlimited record time. I didn't even mention the record time in the others, but this is 29.59, 29.59, 29.59, and unlimited. Unlimited. Did you hear me? Unlimited. Now, I have to preface this check mark with one thing. If we take autofocus capabilities in video shooting out of the equation altogether, Panasonic knocked it out of the park with the video features in this camera. The internal recording and with the firmware update, the paid firmware update, the 422 internal, come on now. This is a solid offering. You're getting a check mark. Let me jump in here real quick and let you know that I have four educational video guides that can help you either take better pictures or learn how to shoot and edit video. For more information and to check out free previews, head on over to fronosphoto.com guides. Now, let's get back to the video. Now, it's important to talk about the autofocus capabilities as it comes to video, because in the past Nikon, we would have just knocked it off the desk here because it didn't have any that actually were good. Now, let's talk about the Z6. There's auto area AF subject tracking, which is similar to dual pixel AF, and you can adjust the tracking speed and focusing speed, and it does have face detection. The Nikon does a very good job out of nowhere they hit it out of the park, giving you continuous autofocus that is extremely usable. I mean, we use it for our run and gun videos and a lot of the real world reviews that we have shot. In fact, we're using it to record with these two cameras, except we don't have the autofocus on because I'm not moving, so we locked it in. Now moving on to the Sony, it has phase detect autofocus. It does an incredible job with autofocus tracking. It is, I mean, what they did with this camera, being one of the only ones on the market at the time when it first came out to do this type of stuff, this was the go-to. It's now more of a crowded field, so it's a little bit more of a tough decision, but this is still a fantastic body. Now, Canon, on the other hand, offers you dual pixel AF with IAF when it comes to video. Dual pixel AF, I love the cinematic feel of dual pixel AF. When they introduced dual pixel AF back in the day, 
fantastic, mind-blowing. It is still an extremely good cinematic look with continuous autofocus. I'd probably pick this one for, you know, if it was, if it had better video features, I would love to have dual pixel AF for video in, well, any of these cameras for that matter. And finally, the Panasonic S1's Achilles heel is the DFD AF, yeah. Basically what you see in the background is a lot of pulsing going on the entire time. It's like, it has Parkinson's. It's always shifting and shaking, which makes it basically unusable when you are trying to do run and gun video. Though we love the video features in it, it's Achilles heel right now is it's continuous autofocus. We decided to go with the Nikon Z6s for our run and gun videos because all around we love the sharpness, we love the contrast that we get right off this camera. The autofocus capability is extremely usable, though we do like what we get out of the a7 III as well. And the EOS R's dual pixel AF is awesome. For us personally, we went and we looked at everything that we get out of a camera and we went with the Z6s personally. Some of you out there may just stick with the, the Sony and think that's the best choice. And some of you will, well, I don't know that many of you will go with the EOS R for shooting video. So we're given a check mark, the Z6. Ever since the dawn of mirrorless cameras, battery life has been a major issue. So I'm gonna go down the line and tell you about battery life. Good battery life, good battery life, good battery life. Horrible battery life in the Panasonic S1. It has the largest battery, yet the worst battery life of them all. It's kind of a toss up between the Z6 and the, and the A7 III, though the A7 III's Z battery is fantastic. This may be the right choice and the best option if you're looking for the best battery. The EOS R did a very good job on the battery, but there's two cameras up here that do allow you to plug in USB-C for charging and shooting at the same time. The Panasonic and the Sony let you do that. The others offer the USB-C charging, but you can't shoot while doing that. We're gonna go ahead and give a check mark to the Sony. Speaking of batteries, let's talk about battery grips, starting with the Z6. There's no battery grip. I've yelled at Nikon enough for that. I'll continue to yell at them until there's an actual grip that comes out. So that sucks, no grip. So no vertical shooting. Uh, the, the Sony has one grip that you can use on all three of their cameras that are out. That's a great thing. Thank you, and you put two batteries in it, thus extending the battery life. The EOS R, you can get a battery grip, and you get all the controls when you go vertical. Panasonic, you can get a battery grip. The winner here is not the Nikon. You suck at battery grips, so you lose a check mark. Take that. Let's take a look at how much these cameras weigh. The Nikon Z6 weighs in at 1.29 pounds or 585 grams. The a7 III is 1.43 pounds or 650 grams. The EOS R comes in at 1.45 pounds, 660 grams. And the S1 needs to go on a diet because it weighs 1.98 pounds or 898 grams. It actually doesn't need to go on a diet. The funny thing is when the EOS R came out, it was more, it had more of a feel of a DSLR than the other two. The Nikon Z6 feels fantastic in the hands. It would feel better with a vertical grip, but it has a very nice deep grip. The Sony, on the other hand, still feels like the worst camera to hold. Not the worst in the history of cameras. It just has a different plasticky, rubbery feel where the rubber feels more like plastic and is a little more slippery. And the way that the buttons and dials are set up, it feels a little more dainty and there's not as much to hold on to. That's something that I hope they change. The EOS R feels fantastic in the hands all the way around. And the largest camera of them all, the S1, feels like a D850, because the D850 was heavier as a DSLR. This is the heaviest mirrorless camera that I've held on to, and it feels really substantial, really well built. Uh, I'm giving them a check mark for build quality, but if I had to decide between the others, <laughs> the Sony would come in last, and would probably, I'd probably go with the EOS R feel over the Nikon Z6 feel if I had to choose. Would you like to show the world that you shoot raw? Well, at store.fronosphoto.com, you can pick up this shirt or many other shirts as well as lens cloths, hats, camera bags, and accessories. So head on over to store.fronosphoto.com right now to pick up some I Shoot Raw swag. Now, since we're talking about the body, the S1 has back illuminated buttons. I love back illuminated buttons. The S1 has buttons in the right places that just feel good. 
I really like what they did. My whole thing after using the S1 during the real world review was, if this said Sony, Nikon, or Canon on the front of it and had their autofocusing systems, then this would be like the end all and be all mirrorless camera of today. But it, it's not, it's not far off. They did a fantastic job with this camera and feel wise and feature wise for the, the outside of the camera, I'm really happy because it just, it fits in the hands and it just makes sense where they put the buttons. I hope that Sony decides to reinvent their body so that it just feels more like a camera, in my opinion. Um, other than that, I think Nikon and Canon are off to a good start. I just hope they aren't afraid to go even bigger to match the S1. And finally, price, because price is important. The Z6 is $1,796 with a free F to Z adapter. The A7 III comes in at just under $2,000. The EOS R just dropped in price to $1,999. Now they are charging you $99 for the adapter. Highly recommend that if you have EF glass, but really 2,000 bucks. This thing came out at $2,400 and they've already dropped the price of it. And the S1 is pulling up the rear at $2,497. The best all around just affordability thing here is the Nikon. I mean, shit, $1,796 with an adapter. That is a fantastic price point. Sony at two grand is still a steal all day long. If you're a Canon shooter and you have a ton of EF glass and you're not jumping ship and you need a camera that shoots silent and you just really want a mirrorless camera for two grand, if you're a working professional and you need some of the things that this gives you, say you have a, a 5D Mark IV, this is pretty much on par with a 5D Mark IV. It's pretty darn close. For two grand, you throw this in your bag as a full-time professional photographer. The hardest one up here to recommend at this current juncture is the Panasonic S1. There's just not enough glass out for it yet. Give it a year, year and a half, give it two years, enough glass. The video features are fantastic. Get them to update that autofocus system, which needs to be updated for video more so than the stills because it did an okay job. Then we can talk. I am surprised as hell that I would say that about a Panasonic camera. I never thought that we would consider Panasonic as a system to be standing up here next to these other two. Now, before anybody yells and says, Jared, but what about Fuji? They don't have full frame, they went above full frame, so it doesn't fit onto this table and it doesn't fit into this price point. That's why it's not here. Let me jump in here real quick and say, if you're looking to pick up any of these cameras or any camera gear for that matter, head on over to adorama.com slash fro because when you use that link, it helps us to continue to make these videos that we love to make for you. With all of that being said, which one would you go with and why? Leave some comments down below. We went with a bunch of Z6s because it fit what I already own. I own a lot of Nikon glass. I've been a Nikon shooter for a long time. Sony, this is an unbelievable camera that you cannot go wrong with. You just have to invest in some glass if you're jumping from the other systems. We've told you about the EOS R. If you're heavily invested in the Canon, pick one of those up. And the S1, I think is a, it's too soon to tell you to go ahead and buy that. So I'm gonna leave it right there. I hope this video helped you out. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And that is where we're gonna leave it. Jared Polinfronosphoto.com. See ya.